and they stopped group and brought me into the office and said that the Secret Service had just called and I'd been federally indicted and they were on their way to come get me. We are in such a dire crisis that we need to just keep people alive. Like, keep your high and mighty opinions for later because we need to keep people alive right now. Welcome to the Recovery Soapbox, uh, brought to you by Brighton Recovery Center. Um, welcome to our listeners out there. Um, if you've heard these podcasts before, welcome back. If you are just signing in, welcome. Um, this is another episode of Women in Recovery, and uh, we are super, super, super excited for our guest today, Mindy Vincent. Woohoo! Uh, a <laughs> very dear friend of mine. Um, you guys are funny. And we have shared this recovery journey together for <coughs> quite a few years now. Ten. Uh, who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I do want to take a minute first and kind of share about um, what my hope is, and, and Lacey, please also jump into um, mm-hmm. about what our hope is for this women's series, Women in Recovery. Um, we really just want this to be a platform for proud, strong women in recovery to bring their stories, share their stories, share their voices, um, for us to come together and celebrate each other and empower each other on this journey um, through all of the various paths. And um, my hope also is that for uh, listeners out there, um, if you hear something that resonates, hopefully you find a bit of hope or something you relate mm-hmm. to or resonate with and, um, and share it, um, share the message and share it proudly. And, um, of course, um, feel free to subscribe through Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, um, any of those. And we just hope to keep you coming back, uh, cause we really want this to be, Um, Like I said, just a platform for women in recovery to come together and celebrate. So, And I think women in recovery that also are making a difference in Mm. our community. Yeah. And I believe you're one of those women. So I'm really glad that you're here. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. So, Mindy, will you just start with... uh, introduction of yourself I am a woman in long-term recovery my I like that you said recovery date Mm, I'm stealing that thank you so I do have to say thank you to Mary Jo McMillan Um, of course Mary Jo of course Mary (laughs) Jo one of my all-time favorite people because she really made me think about that differently Um, even from our last conversation our last podcast Um, in other circles it is sobriety date Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I do, I like confirming recovery date, um, especially in platforms like this, um, where we're talking about various, um, paths to recovery. Yes. Um, and, um, that your recovery doesn't have to look exactly like mine. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to mean what it, to you, what it means to me. Yeah. Um, so Anyway, just wanted to say again, thank you, Mary Jo, for that. Shout out, Mary Jo. Shout out, Mary Jo. Yay! (laughs) We love Mary Jo. Yes, I Um, love Mary Jo. Yes. So, thank you. Continue. Um, So, my recovery day is April 22nd of 2007. So, when you said that we have walked this path since the beginning, and I said 10 years, it's because I just got 10 years. So, congrats. Yeah, like double digits. Dude, yeah, I can't talk about that or I'll cry. So if I, I'm you so cry. grateful for my you life cry. today that there's lots of pieces of my life that will make me easily tear up because I'm just so overwhelmed with gratitude every single day. Like even just driving here, I kept looking around. And I was like, oh, look at the beautiful pine trees mm-hmm. and the red rocks. I mm-hmm. just, I just love the world I live in. Mm-hmm. I enjoy every moment of being alive. Mm-hmm. Living is my favorite thing to do. <laughs> it is. So, um, I, uh, what else would you like to know in the beginning? Well, I guess without further ado, let's just dive right in. And okay. Mindy, please share with us your story. Um, okay. I will share a condensed version. Okay. Because we don't have all day. No, I'm joking. <laughs> well, nor do we have a whole hour. So, 
uh, because I'm so used to sharing my story in a certain type of format, uh-huh. you know? Uh-huh. And so <clears throat> I get that. And yeah. I want this, then you to have be, to chop it up. You yeah. Know? Well, <laughs> like, and I just want this to be candid and raw and real and, and whatever comes up and whatever yeah. comes up. This is about sharing from the heart. Yeah. Well, right. I did just pray and, and ask Perfect. my higher power to just put in my mouth what he would have me say, mm-hmm. you know? So, and that's Perfect. typically what I do. So yeah. no, that's always what I do. So, um, I did not grow up in a dysfunctional alcoholic home. Mm-hmm. I grew up in a nice Mormon family mm-hmm. and Um, I never saw drugs or alcohol, no one smoked, like that was something people did in other states and other places, not where I lived, Mm -hmm. you know, or there were always like, you know, those, those neighbors, you know, they were of course my friends, but my parents didn't like them, but, um, but there was always something different about me all my life, like not that I didn't belong necessarily, because people, I'm a people person, people love me, and I love people, Um, but I always... I don't know when I was little like two years old I used to break into the medicine cabinets and I eat all the medicine you know and not because I like the effects produced by amoxicillin I just liked the taste (laughs) but my parents had to like lock the cabinets and keep them away from me so like when I was two years old I drank a bottle of iodine and had to get my stomach pumped for the first time you know and then when I was like five years old I used to stand behind my dad's car in the morning when it was warming up and I'd stand at the tailpipes and just and sniff the gas you know and I think that my parents should have noticed like there's something different about our daughter she seems to be she seems to be drawn towards some type of substances you know (laughs) but they didn't notice um so anyway when I was young my mom actually got into cocaine which was it was the 80s and you know but that was weird for my family you know my Mom went back to work, which was also not normal in my culture, in my family. But uh, she went back to work and she started using cocaine. And my mom stopped coming home. And my parents eventually ended up separating. And on my seventh birthday, my mom came to my birthday party. She brought me a Cabbage Patch Kid. She said she was going to go to the car to get the rest of my presents. And my mom didn't come back. Mm -hmm. And so even though that is not why I started using, the trauma from those incidences because that's also when abuse started in my home and it you know physical abuse and i i have long forgiven my dad for that and i really do understand the kind of pressure he must have been under to be raising four young children and have his wife just walk out Mm -hmm. you know so anyway that's when the abuse started as well and those things again they're not why i started using but they traumatized me and taught me that I can't trust people, you know, and and that is where my self-defeating behavior of inability to trust developed. And that's where I learned that I I can't count on anybody, that I can't be vulnerable and show people my feelings or they'll take advantage of me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that's how I began living my life. I used to watch my big sister sit on the porch because my mom ended up being gone for like two and a half years. We didn't even know where she was. But when she finally did come back, she was like in and out of our lives and my sister would sit on the front porch with her suitcase and wait for my mom for hours and hours Mm -hmm. and would cry and i would go out and i'd say maline she's not coming you need to stop letting yourself look like an idiot get your stuff and come inside you know Mm -hmm. and i was like eight years old telling eight nine years old telling her that you know but that just shows where that negative belief started for me yeah. well that, yeah that was your coping at the time exactly and it yeah. also fed this belief of that i'm just not good enough yeah i'm not good enough to stick around for i'm not good enough to parent like i just don't do things right you know just all sorts of negative things so but i didn't know any of that at the time mm-hmm. so um i started using drugs when i was well i had my first drink when i was 10 but that was just because I was in a house sluffing school and there were be- there was beer there and I thought, well, we should definitely drink that, you know, because I was always a very rebellious kid. So it actually doesn't you surprise me rebellious? that I got into drugs. No, <laughs> I, I know. Never huh? guessed. What? I am very wild Mindy? by nature. Rebellious? No way. <laughs> and I also gravitate toward people who are also very free spirited and wild and like to have a good time, which, so that explains why I like to hang out with drug users and drinkers, because they're a hoot, you know? And I'm a hoot. (laughs) You are are people that are hoot. (laughs) So, um, so anyway, so the the first time I drank, nothing happened from there, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, But when I was 12 years old, my stepmom kicked me out of the house. I went to go live with my mom, uh, who was not on cocaine at the time, but was an alcoholic, the kind of alcoholic who's in the bar from 10 in the morning until 3 a.m. because she works there, so she has an excuse, (laughs) you know? So, um, I moved in with her and I had no parental supervision. 
you know, and I just, I felt lonely. You know, my relationship with, with, with my dad was like destroyed. I hated my stepmom. Mm -hmm. um, I was getting locked up a lot, getting put in and out of foster care and getting put in group homes and stuff. And so I'd escape from all those places and run. And eventually by the time I was 16, the state emancipated me because they just couldn't keep me somewhere, you know? So, um, and in that time, like by the time I was 13, I started smoking crack and I didn't like crack because it makes you Jones, you know? And I would watch my best friend take a crack hit and then do anything for more. And I was like, Psh, that's never gonna be me. Right. You know, and, and anybody who's heard my story knows, like I will openly say that I was a super judgmental drug addict. I have a million reasons why you have a problem and you have a problem, mm -hmm. but I don't. Oh, I but you guys so better get yourselves really, in check. You guys are the yeah. ones. <laughs> right. Your you lives are, are falling ones. apart. Right. <laughs> you know? Seriously. Yeah. So, and I, I really believe that other people had a problem, you know? So that was right around when Crank was coming out, meth. And, um, and like it says in the big book, I have arrived. Like it said on my GPS when I pulled up here, you have arrived. <laughs> so I had arrived. I'd found the drug that worked for me. I, and just to jump in real quick, as you were saying that, like I vividly remember the first time I used meth, I thought it was a spiritual experience. Yeah. Like this is how God wants me to feel. Yeah. I think I tried um, meth too late. And <laughs> it wasn't good by the time yeah, I tried it. It's and, been long but, gone. <laughs> as I say, like, I'm not, um, like, promoting that by any means. But, right. like, that, um, it was that intense from the very beginning. Yeah. And from that second forward, it was chasing that. Yeah. See, it, and for me, like, I, I liked what meth did. It didn't make me Jones for it, um, and it kept me awake. And I was so productive. Right, you could clean your yes. house from top to And more top importantly, you know, when I was 15 and... years old, I didn't have anywhere to live, and I didn't have any money for food, and I didn't have, you know, I didn't even know where my mom was because I'd run from the state, you know, and uh, I sleep behind churches and stuff, and like I didn't. I couldn't eat like you know I needed something that kept me awake so I didn't have to sleep so I didn't have to eat because I didn't have anywhere to go and I didn't have any food and I didn't have any way to get any you know and so it did that for me and it also gave me like a group of people that I could be around and we could be around for days at a time because we're all on meth you know which relieves a lot of stress when you're a teenager you can't take care of yourself right. and you well, have no one and you're alone did, yeah yeah I want to emphasize that was survival yeah that was survival. And I was just trying streets, to hang in there till was, I could find my mom. Yeah. <laughs> like, I finally found her in a bar down on State Street. Like, thank God, you know, and then I moved in with her. And then, but my, my addiction just continued to spiral. And uh, when I was 21 years old, I got pregnant with my son. And by the time I was 21, all my friends had had kids. All my friends had kids and they were like 15 and 16, you know, so their kids were like five years old when I finally had one. But I had watched them you know, get high around their kids, lock themselves in rooms, like neglect their kids. And I was like, dude, I'll never be that kind of mom. And I had my son and the first time I looked at him, I have never known love like that in my life. That's another thing I mean. My son is the greatest gift God ever gave me. And I knew that he was there to save my life and I wanted to stay sober so bad. I wanted to be the mom that he needed me to be. I didn't want to be like all my friends and lose my kid, but when he was six weeks old, I stopped nursing him so I could get high. And I thought that I would just get high sometimes, or if I just kept dope away from my son, that it would be okay, or if I just didn't have tweakers around him, everything would be fine. But that's not how it turned out. And when Nicholas was 19 months old, my parents filed a protective order against me for domestic violence, child abuse, and took my son. Said that if I couldn't protect myself in this volatile relationship, I couldn't protect him. And I actually got arrested that day and uh, got taken to jail because when I get in trouble with the law, I tend to not show up and they tend to keep looking for me. So they finally captured me. Uh, and my parents served me with that protective order and I just hit the ground just crying in jail. And I just didn't stop crying for like over a month, you know. And when I finally got out, I swore I was going to stay sober and I was going to do whatever it took to get my son back. But I didn't know how to do that. Like, I didn't even know that AA existed. <laughs> I didn't know anything about treatment. I didn't know there was such a thing as treatment. I just thought that you had to just stop using, you mm -hmm. know? And losing my son is, um, it was the hardest thing at that time I'd ever gone through. And uh, it hurt so bad that I couldn't stay sober. I needed to medicate. And 
that's the first time in my life that meth didn't take it away either though mm -hmm. i would just sit there puffing on the pipe crying my eyes out you know and uh that went on for 20 more months and i ended up getting in a lot of trouble with the law and i ended up getting sentenced to three years in jail all consecutive with no good time and uh the girls in jail where they were like dude you've got to write your judges and you've got to go to treatment and i was like okay you know so i start writing my judges and and i uh, i went before all my judges and they all released me to go to treatment at the house of hope and i went to the house of hope and i filed all my own paperwork and fought my parents for custody of my son back and i got my son back mm -hmm. and i swore just like every person i've ever known that's lost their kid because of addiction that uh, when I got him back, I was like, oh, if I ever even want to use, I'll just look at his face. I'll never use again. You know, I don't even know how that long that lasted, but it wasn't very long because I was drinking while I was in treatment too. And I was drinking alcoholically and I was stealing the breathalyzer so that I could breathalyze myself so I could keep drinking. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that that was weird. I thought that was treatment's fault because they were <clears throat> keeping me a meth addict from drinking. Mm -hmm. um, so it's no surprise <laughs> that by the time I got out of treatment that that would progress mm -hmm. you know so within a few months getting out of treatment i was using again and within a year i lost my son again mm -hmm. and this time i had to give him to, i gave him to his dad who he didn't even know his dad had been in prison all his life um and when i don't have my son i really don't have anything to live for you know he's the greatest thing in, in that time he was the only great thing in my life you know and being without him I'm convinced that most women, like once they lose their kids, that's when their cycle of self-destruction really begins. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you're a mom, you find this purpose that you've never had before. Mm -hmm. And somebody takes that from you and takes away something that you love so deeply. Mm -hmm. Man, it's so hard. So I went off the chain again. Mm -hmm. And this time I got in even more trouble with the law. And uh, I got picked up and I wasn't getting back out. And so I was trying to get into drug court, partially because I really wanted to get sober. I could not live like this another day. I really could not. Um, but then partially, too, because I knew I had a bunch more charges coming. <laughs> I was like, I yeah, can roll those in. That'll be wonderful. <laughs> so I pled into drug court. At first, I wasn't accepted because my restitution was three times the amount they allow into drug court. But they let me in anyway. And I got to go into drug court. And from there, I went to the VOA Women's and Children's Center from jail. And then, well, I waited for my bed at the Haven. And I went into the Haven, and I was there 86 days. I graduated. I survived the Haven. <laughs> That's hard to That's do. That's an accomplishment. It is. It, that itself it is. is the an Haven was, you know, both the House of Hope and the Haven were life changing for me. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. just life changing. Even though I relapsed after the House of Hope, mm -hmm. that program probably changed my life more than anything, anything else that I've ever done in my life. So when I graduated the Haven, I moved into, I was actually the first person that ever lived in the Haven sober their transitional living. I put together all the beds that are in the, Richard, the Gillespie house. Mm -hmm. It didn't have a name at that time. It was more like Mindy's house. <laughs> <laughs> I put together all those beds and like it wasn't approved by the county yet. So like I'd sleep and then I'd have to go put all my stuff downstairs and then go hang out over at the Haven. You know, cause I just didn't feel safe. Like I could, I just didn't think I could stay safe outside of in treatment. The world. I yeah. just couldn't. Yeah. I needed to be as close to these people in recovery as I could get, you know, so. While I was in the Haven, though, um, you know how after you've been on a long run, you finally go to the doctor and da 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 So I went out to Fourth Street Clinic, and they told me that I had contracted hep C through sharing needles. And I was so sad, and I remember walking back to the Haven and, like, thinking, why well, I, I even when the doctor said it, I was like, oh, I need a drink. And I don't know if I, like, said it out loud or what, because the first thing she said was, you know you can't drink anymore, right? And I was like, what? <laughs> you know? So I thought, how am I going to get back to the Haven, like, without stopping at that liquor store? You know, plus I had to walk through Pioneer Park and everything. And I never got anything at Pioneer Park anyway. But you never know when you're vulnerable what you might do. <laughs> so All those lines you said you would never yes. cross. And then in that yeah. moment, that opportunity's there. Exactly. Um, and anyway. So I made it back to the Haven. And, uh, you know, my group really rallied around me and supported me and loved me. And that was on Monday and on Wednesday we were in group and they stopped group and brought me into the office and said that the Secret Service had just called and that I'd been federally indicted and they were on their way to come get me. And my first thought was, mm, I probably got 10 minutes on these motherfuckers. <laughs> and I was out, like I was gonna 
bounce, you know? But just as quickly, like I'd been working the steps and I had been watching women in recovery, people in recovery, because you know how when you get into recovery, they tell you just do the next right thing. I was like, ah, uh, I don't get it. Like, what? I don't know how to do the next right thing. And well, the more I think about it, the know. further in left field I will end up. <laughs> like, like mm-hmm. what does that mean? Yes. What? Because I, I didn't know what that even looked like. Yeah. I don't know was, what the right thing is. So I had to start with everything opposite of what you initially want to do. Right. If your initial gut instinct is to run, you stay. If your initial gut instinct is to not go to a meeting, you get your ass to a meeting. If you don't want to talk to someone, you do talk to someone, whatever. And that for me was initially learning the next right thing. Mm, right. Because I had been running on survival and running on my my illness for so long that that's all that I knew. So And that is what is the right thing for me. Yeah. yeah. Like in the moment. Yeah. Like at least for me when I was using like what is going to benefit Lacey the most? Who cares about everyone else? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. What am I going to gain from it? What yeah. am I going to get out of it? Yeah. And yeah, I just did it. Like, even when I tried to do the right thing, it was just always the wrong choice. Mm-hmm. You know, I just always made the wrong choices. Yeah. You know, like I just tore through everything in my life always, you know, and, and even when I thought I was doing the right thing, I never was, you know, mm-hmm. so I just didn't feel comfortable when people would tell me that kind of thing. So I started watching like all these people around me and I would think about who I wanted to be and what I wanted to be, what values I wanted to hold. And I'd look at people that I thought held those values and I'd say, hmm, what does she do that makes me think that way of her, you know? And then I'd model those behaviors because <laughs> I really didn't get it. I was like, I don't understand, <laughs> like, you know? So anyway, so I had been working this long enough and been watching people over the last few months I was in treatment and realized that like just, as much as I wanted to run, I couldn't run. I had to stay and face the music. And so the secret service did come a few minutes later <laughs> and they took me to jail and, uh, a couple days later, I love to tell this part of my story because it's the first time somebody in recovery showed up for me. I was two days later on Friday, I was being taken into court in federal court. And on Thursday, my friend Andrew, and he doesn't care if I share his name, my friend Andrew graduated treatment from the Haven. And Andrew was a big catalyst and a lot of really important change that I made. And he is actually probably one of the first real male friends I ever had that just loved me, you know, and platonically and just wanted what was best for me so anyway so I loved Andrew very much I was very sad to miss his graduation and I was in court and they were reading off my charges and they were you know 30 years maximum two and a half years minimum mandatory and I was just standing there like what have I done and I see this person go flying by the courtroom and then come flying back and it was Andrew and he came into court and uh Uh, My attorney was asking for me to be released on federal pretrial to go back to the Haven and continue drug court. And the judge said, well, is there anybody here from the Haven who could take her? And Andrew stood up and said, my name's Andrew and I'm an alcoholic and I can take her. (laughs) And uh, so I was the only person that was released on federal pretrial and I was released to go back to the Haven. And it's so funny, the Haven has a rule about pairing off. So Andrew actually had to leave me there and go back and get another female, (laughs) but another person. He went back and got my friend Brett and brought him back. So we weren't pairing off. So I didn't get kicked out of treatment on my way back from jail. So, um, (laughs) So I'm super grateful for Andrew that he showed up for me that day. And, you know, I graduated treatment, moved into sober living. A few months later, my parents called me and said, Mindy, move back home. You know, and this are, these are parents who call the police if I even step on, foot on their property. And they asked me to come back home so I could have my son back. So I moved back home in December. I took my son back. Um, my son has not been away from me again since. You know, in November of that same year, my best friend committed suicide and I was seven and a half months sober and I didn't know how I could live through it. But all these people from AA and the Haven just surrounded me and like they wouldn't leave me alone even when I wanted them to. Um, You know, so I couldn't have relapsed if I wanted to because they wouldn't leave me alone, you know, (laughs) so. But I also knew in that moment that there was no drug or alcohol that could take away that pain and even more so that Toby would see it, you know, and, and I owe him more than that. I owed him, he's the only amends I didn't get to make. He died before I got to make my mm-hmm. amends. So staying sober is the best way I know. Yeah. You know, so. Then it becomes a living amends. Yes. 
and living your life and living to honor that person. Yes. So as I get out of treatment, I take my son back. You know, I'm going through my federal case, and um, I had a charge of aggravated identity theft. But I didn't steal anybody's identity. I used my own identity and changed the number on the top. And one of the times I changed the number, it happened to be somebody else's driver's license number. And that carries a two and a half year minimum mandatory in prison. Uh, and so I would talk to my attorney and I'd tell him, you know, I, I want to fight that charge. You know, I, I'm not taking that minimum mandatory. And I'd tell him, you know, I've got God in my life today. Whatever his will is for me is what will happen. My attorney must have thought I was insane, <laughs> but I did exactly what my gut told me, you know, and I ended up being the first person in the United States history to ever have that charge dismissed in a federal court. I won. Uh, and then I ended up pleading guilty to bank fraud, and I was going to have to do 24 to 36 months in federal prison, and I was ready to go to prison. Uh, and I just want to interject, yeah. Mindy, because... Alyssa walked with me through this whole thing. <laughs> this is... The time that our paths crossed mm -hmm. and I so remember watching you walk through all of that scared shitless yeah but also with such grace and trust in like we just fucking rallied around you yeah um, and watching you walk through that was so inspiring for me even in my journey and, and like you know, if I had had a, a rough day or a, whatever trivial problems, you were still walking through it and you were still facing it and looking at it as cleaning up the wreckage and facing the music yeah. um, to clean that path and create that new life that for you and your son. Yes. Um, and I, I, it was such an honor and still is. And that's why I love sharing, sharing that story because it is so powerful um because those were some rough scary scary days yeah um but watching you walk through all of that um for me at least in my mind any excuses that i had in my head went out the fucking window yeah because you were showing up to go into prison for a very long time sober and in recovery yeah what, what was what turned it around for me is that well one I didn't feel like I told you I had come to a place when I got to jail the last time where I was like I mean I was ready to beat my head up against a concrete wall I could not do it anymore mm -hmm. like it talks about this part in the big book that says we come to a turning point we can't imagine going on with drugs and alcohol mm -hmm. or well with alcohol we can't imagine going back right. something happened where I got pushed a little bit closer toward I can't imagine living my life with this anymore mm -hmm. so it was like going back was not an option I whatever was in front of me it had to be at some point it had to be better than what than I what came was from behind. Mm -hmm. you know and uh and I did a four step I did my first four step and that changed my life because I realized that everything I step on the toes of my fellows they wish to retaliate seemingly without provocation <laughs> but we always like that at some point in the past <laughs> We have, you know, we have done something to them first. So learning that, it taught me accountability. And it taught me that, like, I have to show up and I have to make things right. So I stood before the judge for sentencing that day. And I told him that I owe a debt to society that can't be paid through a prison sentence or through restitution. That my primary purpose today was to carry a message of hope and recovery to a still suffering alcoholic and addict. And I would do it from a prison cell. And he said, well, can you do it from home? I was like, oh. Yes, I'll start meeting at my house today. <laughs> you know, and it was just amazing because when I went into court, into federal court to be sentenced, like the whole courtroom was filled with people from Alcoholics Anonymous and Cocaine Anonymous who, who stood by me and who wrote letters and who spoke on my behalf. My sponsor got up and called me constitutionally honest, not something I've been called before. My stepmom, who I viewed as intentionally trying to destroy my life all my life, she got up and spoke on my behalf. And I ended up getting granted a downward departure, and I was given 90 days on home confinement and five years on federal probation. And part of my sentence was that I had to go to a meeting. I had to be released off, home, off house arrest every day to go to a meeting and share my experience with another woman who's walking through what I've walked through. And so I completed my federal probation two years early. Ten days before I got sentenced federally, I graduated drug court 
which is probably a huge part of why I a huge part of why I didn't get sent to federal prison. Um, I also didn't get sent to prison in Nevada because I had graduated drug court five days before that sentencing, you know, because the wreckage just kept coming. Like when I got sober, the wreckage just kept coming. I mean, I've been to jail twice in sobriety, <laughs> dead sober, and you know, because it waits for me. <laughs> I use this analogy a lot because I, I remember feeling this way. It's like when I was using and drinking and partying, I didn't stop and I just kept the momentum going and essentially like created this tidal wave mm -hmm. of wreckage and this tidal wave of shit and chaos and all the destroyed relationships, all the hurt feelings, all the mistrust, all of the legal stuff, all of that shit that we run from. And when I finally got to choose into recovery and stopped, it came crashing down and yeah. it felt like it just kept crashing down. And something that I learned then that just kind of it became my mantra and I still use with people is okay then now we get to learn to surf yeah right and you ride the fucking waves and it does it keeps crashing and it keeps coming but as long and that's what doing the next right thing means right, right? you ride it out and you face it and you walk through it the only way through it is through it and then the peace comes. Yeah. That's true. That's hard though. Yeah. Like what I mean, right? Like I think that's why a lot of people don't stay sober because yeah. it's too it's so much to deal with. Yeah. Like it's so much and harder. It's to so keep brutal. Creative, it's <laughs> so I know. <laughs> it's so hard. And I mean I've gotten through it. Same thing with me. Like I got sober and all this stuff from my past came up, all this like fraud that I did and different yeah. things like that and like I didn't have a driver's license I couldn't get around to anywhere like I didn't have a car I didn't have a cell phone like I had to work two jobs but didn't have a way to get I mean I get all of it but it it feels like you're drowning yeah. and it's so hard to look past like I have to get through all of this it just feels like oh, all this is just it's taking over um yeah but you know you I mean that doesn't happen Mm -mm. like what you went through downward departures don't happen like right. when you're talking to people who are in the legal realm they're like you got a downward departure what and i'm gonna ask my mom what that is what? <laughs> you know a downward departure lowers your federal sentencing guidelines from like it lowered mine from 24 to 36 months to 6 to 12 months and so then when he said that i was like oh, i'm only going to prison for 6 to 12 months yes you know i was stoked yeah. to go to prison for yeah. 6 to 12 months and then when he went outside of that that's another thing that doesn't happen in the federal system there's these guidelines and the judges have little to no control of going outside of those guidelines and what the, what the judge sentenced me to wasn't even legal by law and the the prosecutor stood up and was like you can't do that and he said he was going to contest it but he never did yeah. he said that he would just wait for me to fall because he knew that i would and then he'd make sure i got sentenced out <laughs> you know but i didn't i didn't fall i stayed sober and i kept doing the next right thing and and i I just continue to relish in the love and support of all the people mm -hmm. around me, you know, because I definitely didn't walk through that alone. And in fact, it's so funny, like the fellowship and people in recovery are so amazing and wonderful that when I knew that I had to go to prison, I was like, huh, well, how do you go to prison? You know, because I have never turned myself into prison. I don't even turn myself into jail, detox, none of it, you know. So I didn't know how to get to federal prison in Dublin, California. And I thought maybe I should take a plane and catch a cab. <laughs> should I bring an overnight bag? What should I do? So I reached out, or actually I was talking to my friend Patrick, who is my friend from Cocaine Anonymous who lives in the UK. And I was talking to him and I was like, what should I do? And he's like, let me put something out there. So he puts out on the Hope, Faith, and Courage website, says my friend Mindy's going to prison in California. Can anybody help her? And my whole email box by the next day was full of all these people from Cocaine Anonymous in California who reached out to me and said, do you just fly in a day early? You'll stay with us. We'll make you a nice dinner and we'll take you to prison the next day. You don't have to go there alone. And I was mm -hmm. like, these people don't even know me. Like I can be going to prison for murder and like they don't even care. They were like, just please let us love you through it. You know, so none of this I walked through alone, mm -hmm. never. You know, Alyssa was a huge support in my, 
it, she's been a huge support my whole life in recovery, <laughs> you know, but Sarah Kapos, like mm-hmm. she's the woman that I probably watched the very most of my early recovery that really taught me how to be a woman in recovery. Yeah. And I don't even know if she knows that she had that big of an impact on me. I still carry her one year chip with me oh, yeah, and it's been yeah. 10 years. <laughs> like she's had a huge impact on me, but it was, it was through all of that, like knowing and unknowing that all these people changed my life, you know? And I ended up going back to school. I terminated off federal probation two years early, three years early. I went back to school and got my, my college degree, which I'm the first person in my family to get a college degree. I went on, on, I went on and got my master's degree in social work. Mm-hmm. I am halfway through my master's of public administration program at the University of Utah, the executive program. I started a private practice. I and then I founded the Utah Harm Reduction Coalition, and. We are the first legal provider of syringe exchange services in the state of Utah, and we are the largest, and we will continue to be. <laughs> You're the largest syringe exchange provider in the state. In Yeah, in the okay. State. So life has amazing. been very good to me. I have mm-hmm. another little girl who's amazing. I've gotten to speak nationally for drug courts. Mm-hmm. And when I was uh, in 2014, when I was seven and a half years sober, my big sister died of an opiate overdose. And... Um, it's a real 50-50 shot if I can talk about that without crying. Because <laughs> I tell people every day that I wake up and she's not here. It's still the worst thing that ever happened to me. Mm. I miss her so much. I'd give up everything just to have her with me. But losing my sister changed my whole path. It changed everything. Like, right that moment, my world stopped spinning. You know, and my baby brother was still addicted to heroin and I was willing to do whatever it took to save his life. And before that, I was definitely one of those people who had, like, this high and mighty kind of thing about recovery. Like, that's wonderful if you're in recovery, but if it's not 12-step recovery, then it's not as good as mine. (laughs) You know, and I feel like such a piece of shit for every time that I made anybody feel like their recovery wasn't enough for me. Because my little brother, no matter what had I put on, it was the wrong one. He's not interested in meetings. You know, he needed methadone. And, and he needed counseling. He didn't need meetings and, I mean, he didn't need what I needed, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And right then, I learned what it meant to meet somebody right where they're at without judgment, like, because I did not care. And when people, even my 12-step friends would tell me things like, Mindy, you can't do it for him. And I told him, you know what, shut up. You have no idea what I'm going through. You have no idea what it's like to lose your sister and be trying to save your brother's life. Shut up, <laughs> you know? And I paid for my brother's methadone twice, and it was well worth every single penny because today my brother's over two years sober, Mm. you know, but it changed my whole path. It changed my whole path. Like, I suddenly realized that abstinence isn't for everybody, and it's not my choice to decide that for anybody, you know? Like, people can come into 12 steps. They can come out of 12 steps. They could have never gone into 12 steps at all, and guess what? Their recovery is just as valid as mine. Mm -hmm. Like, if they stopped smoking crack and now they just drink beer, good for you. Good for you. Like, who am I to decide Mm -hmm. what somebody's recovery should look like? And that's what turned me toward harm reduction is like with all these people that are dying from opiates, like it never should have been my sister. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be anybody's sister. It shouldn't be anybody's brother, you know? It shouldn't be anybody's parent or mom. mom. Exactly. It's like it shouldn't be any of them. Mm -hmm. And we are in such a dire crisis that we need to just keep people alive. Like, keep your high and mighty opinions for later because we need to keep people alive right now. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I got into harm reduction. Mm-hmm. And it's actually been the greatest thing I've ever gotten to do. Loving people in all of their darkness, mm-hmm. in their worst place, when most people don't love them, mm-hmm. I get to love them. And it's amazing. And I have to say, Mindy, and that's why I love your story because I love and honor that about you because of all of the darkest places that you've been to you absolutely have this profound way of just loving people wherever they're at um and and being that light and being that hope um you know I I look at like recovery is a continuum it is hardcore abstinence over here yep which, yes, I will say, I personally believe, like, that that's the goal. Yeah. Right? And then 
for you, for, for me, for you, right? Yeah. Right, right. Maybe and not for other people, and that's okay. Because well, <laughs> like, I say that because for me, thinking that I could replace meth for alcohol or right. this for that or this for that, that almost fucking killed me too. Yep. Um, but some people but, that doesn't happen to them, right? You know, so and, we have to allow people to do whatever is best for them, and then just be there and, as their support and landing ground when right. they find that that path didn't actually work out as they had planned. Right. You know, right? Because like, your experience love, is your truth. Mine is mine. Right. Mm-hmm. Theirs is ours. Right. And it there's thousands of paths to recovery. Yes. And it's not about arguing this or that. It's saving lives. Yes. Bottom line, it's about saving lives. And if I look at whatever path is, like, each part of my journey was a stepping stone. Yeah. And, yes, for me, abstinence is my goal. And and knowing how the disease works and, and the brain, I know for me, I can't replace one with another. Yeah. Um, and I'm a big, big advocate of that. However, at the same time... I also am also a big advocate of meeting them where they're at. Yeah. Um, and and no matter what, being that being that hope and being that light. Yes. And thank you for being in the trenches, literally in the trenches. That's where I belong. With the most, <laughs> and I say that like with the brokenhearted. Not yeah. the broken. Yeah. Nobody's broken. But with the most broken hearted. Yes. And those who have lost all hope. Yeah. And loving them enough and being hope enough and still being that advocate for other paths or other means of recovery and saying, okay, when you're ready or there's this option too, let's get you into detox, let's get you here. Or, um, but no matter what, loving them for where they are yeah absolutely true my sister taught me how to do that it's crazy like losing her changed my life on so many levels but it changed me as a human being my sister losing my sister taught me how to love people in all their light and all their darkness with no judgment and just and actually embracing the darkness the same way you would embrace the the light you know yeah and i'm grateful she taught me the greatest lesson of my life and when she was alive we there was no way I would have known that. <laughs> like, I never would have thought my sister was going to be the single greatest teacher in my life. And look at what she did. Yeah. Like, she left her legacy here through yeah. you. Now, because of her, there's the Walk to Remember at the Capitol, because I started that. That, go, that is before the Rally for Recovery, and I did that because I was like, no one will ever forget my sister's name or my sister's face, ever. Yeah. And I've buried 24 clients over the last three and a half years, and I don't want any of their faces or names forgotten either. Mm-hmm. You know, so I started that, and the whole reason I got into harm reduction is because I just wanted to help the people that people will not help, you know, without judgment, without, like, any expectation. Like, well, this is where you'll need to get to eventually. Like, no, I I don't care where you want to get to, need to get to. How do I just help you get where you want to go? Mm -hmm. You know, what does that look like for you? Mm -hmm. How do we find those stepping stones, you know, that are in the direction you want to go? I don't have any expectation of other people's behavior, their recovery, what it needs to look like. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll support you whatever you want to do. I'll support you while you're still learning and having your experience. Mm-hmm. Or I'll, you know, I'll still love and support you when you get to the end of your journey, whatever that is, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. It's just such a gift. Mm-hmm. Such a gift. And the, the Beatles had it right when they said all the world needs, <laughs> what the world <laughs> needs now is love, sweet love. And that's true. Mm-hmm. Like, love is the healing, you know, yeah. like. Of course, when we're dealing with drug users, they need boundaries and stuff. But if you don't have, you know, 30% boundaries and 70% love, you're doing a disservice to people. People just need to be loved. Because I so remember feeling broken and unlovable and so full of shame from all of the things that I had done. And I had thought that all of that through the darkness of my addiction, that all of that had defined me. Yeah. And I then became that. And it's the people in the rooms of recovery. And I owe who I am today because of those that loved me until I could learn to love myself. Yes. Um, 
through all of it. Um, my character flaws and all, you know. Um, and without that and without learning to then love myself and know that I was worth it yeah. and I am worth it, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. I used to ask myself, you know, why me? Mm -hmm. You know, there are so many people who are more deserving of recovery than I was, that's for sure. And I don't say that because I'm like, I didn't deserve it. Of course, you know, everyone deserves recovery. Yeah. There's a lot of people, though, who have done a lot better things in life than I have, yeah. you know. And I used to ask myself, why me? You know, but now today and for a long time, actually, I'm like, well, why not me? Well, of course it was me. You know, like, it's so funny. I was thinking about that this morning, how the longer... You know, you're on the path of recovery. Um, and, and today, I actually believe I'm recovered. Like, I actually consider myself a recovered mm -hmm. addict and alcoholic. So that person that I used to be is long gone. Like, it's right. a part of my life that's long past, you know. But So, well, on that note, yeah. not to yeah, no, go. detour you, but I, I can, that resonates with me. And I, it, even in the big book, right? It says we have recovered. We have recovered. Um, from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Yeah. And I have recovered. Not cured. For me, I, I know that I'm not cured. I know that I am still just as powerless over drugs and alcohol today as my first day sober and my first day in recovery. But... And that if I chose to pick up a drink or, or use today, I absolutely would pick up right where I left off. Probably worse. And it would spiral really fast. But I have recovered from that seemingly hopeless state of mind. And have recovered from, like you said, who I was. And that's not who I am or yeah. where I am. And I get to like who I am today. And I get to be proud. And I get to look myself in the mirror. Yeah. See, and I, I, I agree with you. And I actually have moved a little beyond that place. Like, mm -hmm. I would dare to say that I am cured of addiction. And people would be like, ah, you can't be cured. Uh, yeah, you actually can. And <laughs> science says so. 75 to 80% of people spontaneously recover mm -hmm. and go back to you. Either normal use or none at all. They just grow out of it and they stop. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, I had to have total abstinence because I, in the beginning, I would I would abuse anything, mm -hmm. you know. And it had nothing to do with the substance. I'll abuse freaking sleep or what are those one? Seroquils. <laughs> I'll abuse Seroquils if you give me an opportunity. But today, I'm not that person. Mm -hmm. Like, I am not that person at all. If I... I, if I don't pick up a drink, if I did, I would have a drink and then I'd walk away. I would not drink my whole life away or go start shooting meth because I had a drink. Mm -hmm. And I, to me, it's ridiculous to think that. Like, I feel like oftentimes in recovery, we don't give people the room to recover. Mm -hmm. We don't give people the room to be healed mm -hmm. of their affliction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always, you have to be recovering. Like, if you ever think that you have this thing beat, then you're going to start, you know, then your disease is doing push-ups in your head and you're on your way to the shelter. Mm -hmm. I'm not on my way to the shelter. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I, well, I never went to the shelter anyway. But <laughs> I'm not on my way out, you know? Like, I just, I, I have grown a lot in my own ideas of what recovery is. Mm -hmm. and And I truly do believe that, I understand that people have to hold on to that belief of like, I could never drink like a normal person ever again, even if alcohol wasn't your thing. I know that some people have to hold on to that for self-preservation. Mm -hmm. I don't have to hold on to that lie anymore. Like, I won't drink out of control. I wouldn't shoot meth again anyway because I'm a grown adult with a whole life to live, mm -hmm. you know, and children and responsibilities. And meth doesn't appeal to me anymore. You know, and I don't encourage people, like, people have to have their own experience. I don't encourage people, like, oh, you should go try it. I mean, the big book does say, <laughs> you think you can do control drinking, then go try it, you know. And I tell people, like, if, if that's what you want to do, do that. Um, but I just think that, um, you know, we paint drug users into being such powerless little creatures mm -hmm. that are not capable of of recovering or not capable of one day becoming a whole new person we, you know we don't let that part of our lives like just lie and be a part of who we used to be mm -hmm. 
you know and and i just won't live in that box anymore i and now and actually now most times i say that i'm a person who has a history of addiction Mm because it is a history it is not who i am like Mm -hmm. if somebody was smoking crack right in front of me i wouldn't smoke crack Mm -hmm. i don't smoke crack like when if someone came to me and said let's snort some meth like it would be just as weird to me. I'd be like, um, I don't do meth. Like, that would be just as foreign to right. me as it would be if they said it to somebody who's never done it. That's how far I am from the person I used to be. And I'm sure that I'll get plenty of backlash for saying that. And I don't care. There's mm-hmm. lots of science that backs up what I say. And, and that's just my truth. Right. I know lots of people who, if they have one sip of alcohol mm-hmm. I on Tuesday, they will be at the shelter on Thursday. I've seen it with my own eyes. Yep. You know, I'm not one of those people. Yeah. I mean, I don't try it out and see, but I know. I just know. Mm-hmm. I'm a different person. Mm-hmm. Totally different. Mm-hmm. I truly believe I am recovered, not just from a hopeless state of mind and body. I am recovered from addiction. Yeah. It's not who I am anymore. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that. <laughs> I really do. I appreciate that side. I appreciate your view on things. Um, I feel like I'm... You know, you posted something on Facebook a while ago, and I read it. Um, I bet I know what it was. And it was talking about, like, it was talking about exactly what we've been talking about, meeting people where they're at. And if somebody is, and this stuck out to me, and it made my brain wheels move a little bit when I read it. And it said something about, like, you know, if somebody was, you know, shooting heroin in their neck and now they're on methadone, they are recovered. They are recovered from the place. They're in recovery. They're yeah. recovering from the place that they were before. Yeah. Because oh, um, our friend Patrick, Patrick Rizek, he defines recovery as a place better than the place you were in before. Mm-hmm. And that's absolutely what I've adopted to. Thanks, Patrick. But I, I appreciated that post because it opened up me a little bit to, you know, to you and to what you believe and to um I, it just it got my wheels turning and I appreciate that and um you know for me like I did get sober in AA um me too. that's that's just what that was just my path yep. and um you know I am abstinent from all substances that's just my path but yep. um you know I do a lot of work with FTR and and Rachel and the homeless population and um I appreciate you meeting people where they're at. And I know that's controversial and enabling and all of the things that the people say that it is. And I, I just don't believe that. I And I you said something too about, you know, like people are dying and yeah. it doesn't have to be a certain way anymore. Yeah. Um, Your judgments I, and opinions are killing people. You know, um, people's judgments and opinions and the standards of what recovery must be is literally killing people Mm -hmm. but thank you for doing everything that you do and um and just and having such an open mind to this whole process and it it's people like you in conversations like this that open other people's minds to different things and it's not a wrong way right like there's no wrong way like Mm -hmm. for me it's the way that I chose and continue to choose and yes. you're at a different place and you're at a different place and there's no wrong way. We're all sitting here yes. recovered women yes, and not shooting meth and heroin anymore. And, yes. you know, we have a life and we get to, to show up and do all of these wonderful things for people in this community. And we yes. all have a different approach on yeah. it and look at it. And, um, and the approaches change. And they shift. They change and over shift. Time. Right. I mean, I just celebrated 10 years. So it's like, but for the first eight years of my recovery, um, you know, I'm a Havenite. Like, I was in a meeting every single day for the first 18 months of my sobriety. When they said 90 and 90, I was like, I better, like, quadruple that, you know. Yeah. You know. And and that's what I did. And I'm a diehard. Like, Alyssa and I brought back the entertainment committee for oh. CA, like, uh-huh. which is now thriving and doing uh-huh. very well. Like, uh-huh. I have done tons and tons of service. Like, my whole life was built around that. Mm-hmm. And then I started to learn new truths for me. Yeah. You know? And I started doing a lot of research and, and learning about a lot of science. And, mm-hmm. and I read things that are things that I already thought in my mind. Like, in, in to me, I feel like I outgrew addiction. Like... I've, I've, I have literally, over the last 10 years, watched my own brain develop. Like, I have reasoning and judgment. I can make decisions. Like, I could not do that when I first right. got sober. My, I mean, I started using it when I was 12. My brain was, like, stunted. Mm-hmm. But I've watched my brain develop and grow. And then I, I read about the developmental model of addiction. And I'm like, whoa. Like, that's everything that I thought. Mm-hmm. 
You know, but in the world I come from, if you say that stuff out loud, the first thing everybody's going to say to you is, dude, you need to, you got to get a new sponsor. You got to start working the steps. You need to do 90 and 90 because, Mm -hmm. and it's like, but I've got seven years sober. And they're like, but you're on your way out. You're on your way out. If you don't stay in this tiny little box, you know? And so my recovery, and I never could have imagined that happening to me. You know, and I still, I don't go to meetings anymore, but I love Alcoholics Anonymous and Cocaine Anonymous with all my heart. Like, the 12 steps live within me. They're a part of who I am today. I practice mm-hmm. them so long and work them so many times. It's just what I do. You know, I quote out of the big book to total strangers, like, all the time, you know? So it's just a part of who I am. But I never would have thought that, like, my definition of recovery or my idea of addiction and how to recover from it would have shifted as dramatically as it has. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I can tell you I feel freer today than I've ever felt in my entire life. Mm -hmm. I do. I feel like I know myself and I know... I feel like I understand myself and I understand addiction better than I ever, ever have. And I think the part that makes me understand it the most is that I just understand it for me. Yeah. (laughs) Not for everybody else. And that's something to celebrate. That in and of itself feeling freer than you ever have been and understanding you yeah because I sure as hell didn't understand me yeah when I started recovery I sure as hell didn't understand my head for my ass pretty much right me either my my thoughts my feelings any of it we are the people that have to call their sponsor five times a day for direction on if we should go left or right yep yes yep (laughs) Totally. And totally. today, like, I can totally. direct my own life. Yeah. You know, what a and beautiful I thing. And I get to feel okay with the decisions that I make today. Yes. I get to, like, walk into a grocery store and not panic or freeze because I don't know which aisle to choose. Right. Or driving down the road and I don't know which no, which way to turn. Or... You know, like yeah. I so remember being so easily overwhelmed with the smallest, teeny tiny choices. Yeah. And today I actually get to make kind of some big decisions um, and for myself and just in, in what I do. Um, and I get to trust in my decisions. Yes. I love that. That's something that's that's pretty amazing today see and i viewed you You as capable of making decisions like at least eight years ago so (laughs) that's fantastic you know there's one thing that like if anybody gets anything from this podcast there's just one thing that i'd want people to get is that um you know your recovery is your recovery yeah you know and i've seen a post on facebook something about like religion is like a penis it's fine until you take it out and start waving it at me um and i feel like <laughs> uh, no can we keep that <laughs> please do keep that because this is the analogy that makes sense here. Okay, so, recovery is like that same way and i can speak from this because i am a person who used to be this way you know right. like had these standards of recovery and what recovery really is mm-hmm. you know and it is absolutely i was in that culture so long i know for sure that most people mm-hmm. in you know recovery as most of us define it which usually has to do with 12-step recovery mm-hmm. have these ideas about what is recovery and what's not mm-hmm. you know and for hell's sake like your recovery is your business and everybody else's is theirs Mm -hmm. keep your opinions and your judgments about what recovery has to look like for other people to your damn self Mm -hmm. because you are doing a disservice to people Mm -hmm. allow people to recover however they want allow people to be all the way recovered Mm -hmm. you know don't fill people's heads full of what your experience is trying to make them conform because then what happens is that when somebody does make the decision like you know what i think i can drink like a normal person and it turns out they can guess what all of their support is cut off because everybody in their lives is like, dude, you're drinking. You're on your way out. Mm-hmm. I don't talk to people who drink. Now, do people who have a drink, are they bad people? No. No. But we ostracize people no. from recovery if they don't continue to meet mm-hmm. our definition and our idea of recovery, and it's killing people. Mm-hmm. And it's not only killing people, but it's disconnecting them. Mm-hmm. And that is just... It's got to stop. Mm-hmm. We have to let people all recover however they want to. Everybody's good enough. Everybody's doing fine. You know, and we just love everyone. Mm -hmm. It's really what we need to do. And people need to stop bashing on medication-assisted therapy. That is a research-driven, evidence-based practice. Mm -hmm. You know, just because you didn't need it to recover doesn't mean Joe doesn't need it to recover. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And when I see posts and people saying things about people on medication-assisted therapy not really being sober, they don't get to count their time, 
those people really should shut their mouths, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel really, really strongly about it because med medication assisted therapy is the only way for some people to recover. And again, what business is it of yours? Right. Why is it your business? You know, and we don't allow for space for those people to openly share and be vulnerable mm -hmm. about that in 12 step meetings. And that's the truth. And mm -hmm. people can say whatever they want. I've been in enough meetings and I know mm -hmm. that we ostracize people on medication assisted therapy, me included, I've done it. Mm -hmm. And every day we get a new day to do something different. You right. know, if you really want to love people and help people recover, then let them recover however they want and love them through it all mm -hmm. without expectations, without, well, one day we hope that you'll get to abstinence. Well, maybe some yeah. people don't need to be abstinent. Yeah. I did. You did. You did. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but that's just us. Right. So anyway, so if that, True. please open your minds, open your hearts, just love everybody. Mm -hmm. Will you tell us a little bit about the harm reduction and what you guys do yes so we're the utah harm reduction coalition mm -hmm. <laughs> so we do syringe exchange um we have two of them uh at rio grande on mondays and thursdays from two to five it's right on the block on the island the people that need to know that information already know what the island is mm -hmm. so and then we have two a week in, at daylight recovery out in sandy which is a suboxone methadone clinic which gives us and an outpatient treatment so that gives mm -hmm. us an a, a pathway to get people on medication if they need it right away you know and help people get out of that mess um and then we will have one starting here in weber county any moment now in fact i'm going to make some phone calls about that after this mm -hmm. we have one running in wasatch county Tooele county utah county will be running carbon county is running and will be expanded through the rest of the state before the end of the year wow we just recently received a large um a large award in grant money from the Utah State Health Department. So we awesome. are now a funded organization by the Utah State Health Department. Very cool. So amazing. Are you a five oh are you guys a five oh one C three? We're a nonprofit organization. We desperately need donations because the the money from the health department we can't bill for that for the first time till August first. And mind you, mm -hmm. syringe exchange has been running since December first off basically goodwill and pocket change <laughs> so, uh, so we're just really excited to be able to really meet people where they're at help people like I know how to recover you know mm -hmm. when somebody comes to me and says Mindy I can't live like this anymore it's like then let me show you the way yeah it's like one of the greatest things like next to getting to love people just the way they are the next best part of my job is getting to be a shining example of what recovery can be in somebody's life beautiful it's like the best thing ever mm-hmm like people know that they're safe coming to me. They know they can come to me and tell me whatever. They mm -hmm. can come to me and say, you know what, Mindy, I don't believe this and this and that. I want to do it this way. Mm -hmm. I'm like, great. How do I support you in doing that? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just beautiful. Thanks, Maline, for teaching me to love people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I just love you. I love you. And and your story and some of the topics that are controversial. I know. Um, and and I think that, you know, we in the community, we do. We need to continue to have these discussions um, and these conversations. Um, from our conversation a couple weeks ago, Mindy, like something that was profound that still sticks out to me is, you know, with, with the opiate epidemic that, like, we're all fully aware of. Yeah. Too many people are dying. And... Too many people are dying while we're arguing about who's right and who's wrong. Yeah. Right? And that that also stuck with me. And like Lacey said, kind of like it did. It started to open my mind a little bit. Um, what I know is addiction is not biased. Yep. It affects all people, all walks of life. All, like it's not biased in any way neither is recovery that's true that's true but yeah. i do have to say though addiction does disproportionately affect people of color and people of true. low socioeconomic status true so i do so, have to say that well <laughs> like people are freaking out about the opiate epidemic now uh -huh. because white middle class people are dying right and that's sad that you know sad. because people of color and, and poor people have already been dying mm -hmm. for decades mm -hmm. and we didn't care because they were mm -hmm. poor well, if it takes middle class white people for people to notice mm -hmm. that people are dying from drug addiction, then so have it. My sister was a casualty. So great. Now let's help everybody. Right. Because <laughs> right. there's social issues that keep people addicted. 
You know, it's Agreed. not just about using the substance. Like these people have people have no coping mechanisms. They don't have, uh, you know, they have a lot of trauma. They mm-hmm. have a lot of poverty. It's like, you know, Mental people health. use for lots and yeah. lots of yeah. reasons. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Sad. Agreed. We got a lot of problems to address here, people. <laughs> lots of them. <laughs> we do. We've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and when I say addiction is not biased, yes, unfortunately, there is a population who it does affect more. Yeah. Not minimizing that at all. But what I am saying is just as as many people as it affects, there are also that many paths to recovery. Oh, yes. And the, um, the arms of recovery reach way further than the arms of using. Yeah. Like I can, you Agreed. know, the people I damaged in my using, they're in like this circle here. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a pretty big circle, mm-hmm. but still it's a circle. Mm-hmm. You know, for me being in recovery, every single person I help then helps other people. You yes. guys know what it looks like. Yeah. And it spreads so far, it's unbelievable, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So, like, good always outdoes the mm-hmm. negative, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. And if you just hang in there and they say, don't leave till the miracle happens, like, literally, just don't leave till the miracle happens. Yeah. So many miracles will happen. You'll be like, which yeah. miracle was it? You know? Well, I started started saying, don't leave until the next miracle happens. Oh, I love that. Because. Because one's probably coming tomorrow. One, right. It's that it happens all the because time. Because every day almost. Every day. It does. Every single day. Every Even on crappy day. days. It's, yes. Especially on the crappy days. Do, okay. Even on the crappy days, like, think about it. You're not waking up dope sick. Yeah. You're not waking up not able to get up. You know, I mean, just, mm-hmm. like, I. You're in a bed. Man. Yeah. Remember how just crappy your body felt all the time and how you just always, like, yeah. you know? It's like <laughs> just waking up feeling like you can get up and stretch and move on about the day is mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. That's a miracle. It is. It is. It's a miracle. And it's freedom yes you know right you know yeah. right and the more you learn to stick through things the easier it is to stick through things the next time right that's the thing about fear you have to ask yourself is this going to kill me and if and i mean literally is it going right. to kill you and if the answer is no then your fear is being created in your head and you need to walk mm-hmm. through it anyway mm-hmm. and the more you walk through fear the more that when you're confronted with fear you'll just leap right in yeah. right because you're like dude yeah. no i cannot stand to sit in that place anymore yeah. and yeah. The, and you grow a new normal Right. Everyone can recover. There's not something so spectacular about me or you or you. Even right. though I love you. Uh, there's nothing so special about us that it had to be us and nobody else. Right. You know, right. everybody's right. capable of recovering. Like I said, there's Agreed. a lot of people who deserve to recover more than I did. Mm-hmm. You know, but God lets us be, he lets it be us, you right. know, and he'll let it be you. Right. Just don't give up. Right. So can we wrap it up with Death. never, never, never never fucking give up never never but i do have to say one more thing yes <laughs> um you are important you're very important and i'm so happy that you came on this podcast Thank you. and as being you know someone that you know really tries to help others in the recovery community and like all of the different things that i do and that you do and that you do um like, I just have to say this, like, I don't 100% agree with everything, but you are a breath of fresh air in recovery and this whole thing that's going on. And mm-hmm. um, if you would have been around when I was in the very worst, like, I'm talking, like, so hopeless and no... Like Pueblo? Like Pueblo, Colorado. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I Pueblo. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know, and no, like didn't even know how to like take a shower you know it was just like I didn't I didn't know that there was this life you Mm -hmm. know and I'm assuming that most of the people that you work with don't know that there is this life and um like if you are like an angel that you would have just been like this like saying like it's okay like it doesn't have to look this certain way and here's a clean needle and I know you're probably not ready but I want you to be safe and like it would have made a difference you know yeah. and you're making a difference and I like feel really strongly about what you're doing and I'm so happy that you came on and shared that and yeah you might 
piss some people off, but that's okay. And that's what, well, when they do their walk, they'll find out that's because they're personalizing it and <laughs> yeah. making my experience a generalization to everyone. When I clearly say that my experience right. is my truth, and if you don't agree, you don't have to because yeah. it's not your truth. Right, <laughs> like, right. It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. yeah. But I just want to yeah. thank you for thank you owning your truth and just being you know you and thank you and making it okay for other people to be them. Yeah. And making it okay for me to be me you know yes. and so i love you just how you are i love you just how you um, are i love are all 12 steppers in case people think i don't love 12 steps now i do mm-hmm. we just need to be loving more loving and kind i agree yeah so thank you thank and you, also Lacey. one more question are yeah. you running the spartan this year <gasps> do you know what i think i'm about done with those damn spartans <laughs> <laughs> dude they are just kicking me in the balls they're so rough they're brutal. They are. And as you can see, I'm But they're not so prepared. fun. They're fun. So I'm thinking about doing it next year so I don't get my ass kicked. Uh, well, if you decide, me, Sarah, Georgia. Yes. And another girl from our gym are running it. So. I love it. And yeah. I do have to give a, a shout out to Fit to Recover because mm-hmm. I was on um, Care Sale not too long ago with Ian and Georgia. And they like totally get where, I come, where I'm coming from. And they're like two of the first people that I really talk to you like from that recovering circle who really get it and and are supportive and and you you know being supportive and being like yeah dude whatever it takes as long as we can keep people alive and mm-hmm. and maybe they'll end up here with us and maybe they won't yeah but we'll love them through it right. uh and so that just warms my heart because that means that's another safe place that people can go to absolutely to to get help to find that connection to get that support and it's just so important and people think that there's a lot of support out there but there's a lot of uh sort of conditional support out there yeah. and so when i talk to people who are willing to offer unconditional support it warms my heart yeah no yeah and that is a safe place yeah so yeah so big shout out to them you guys thanks yeah. <laughs> well thank you mindy and thank you Alyssa. So, well i also uh, want to thank you very much, Mindy. I love you, friend. Uh, I love you very much. So grateful I got to come out here. So, so, Thanks for so letting me ripple the waters. You. And thank you for <laughs> rippling the waters. And I will also say, you know, one of the things that I, of course there's many, but one of the things that I love about you is that we can disagree. Yeah. But still respect where each other is, is coming from. And I absolutely honor and admire and respect what you're doing and the work that you're doing and I love you for it Thank you, and your ability to have this radical open mind and love people no matter where they're at is so profound radical and acceptance dude radical acceptance dbt is the greatest therapy <laughs> and <laughs> it is it it, it is that's it's, coming from a therapist, people. It's pretty amazing. It, <laughs> it is. It really is the it's shit. It's so good for people in recovery. Totally. Um, but what you do matters, you Thank know. You. And if anything, if of course there's lots, but one thing that I want people to hear from this is, um, and what you share is, not only are you important, but you have this ability for anyone you come in contact with to feel important. Because they are. Because they are. They are. And you, what I'm saying is you bring that out in Thank people. Thank you. And you, you help us see that and see those that can't see it, see it. Because everybody's important and every life matters. Yes. And we all just need to love each other yeah and you know i love it it's so um love is absolutely healing tolerance is not enough we need mm-hmm. acceptance mm-hmm. who wants to just be tolerated right right we need acceptance right. we do we all need acceptance we all need that unconditional love and support yeah and we all know addiction is a disease of isolation yes right and the more that we promote that isolation and that disconnection, the more we perpetuate it. Yeah. And more perpetuating the problem. We're not stopping it. And what creates disconnection faster than judgment? Exactly. <laughs> you yeah. know, honestly. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
So oh, thanks so much for having thank me. Thank you so yes. much for coming. I don't ever want this to end. I just I want you to keep talking. I know. I wish we had a more comfortable <laughs> chair. I just stay for the rest of the day. I know, right? We could pull Should up have some, pulled one of the many pull up comfortable some, chairs that some are all couches. over the We could order pizza. <laughs> right? Seriously. Pizza. I love pizza. We have a pizza party. <laughs> um, but seriously, Mindy, Lacey, thank, thank you. both of you again you. for sharing your hearts, sharing yourselves, sharing your stories, and just thank you. Thank you. And if there's anybody listening to the podcast who needs help with with staying safer when you're using or exploring alternative paths to recovery or just exploring recovery at all, like you can always reach out to us. We have a Facebook yes. page. Our website is utahharmreduction.org. Like, I mean, you could find my information. You could call me directly, whatever, you know, yes. whatever is necessary. I'm always willing to help. And if someone wanted to get involved in that, how do they yes. do that? Reach out to me. Okay. <laughs> so you okay. can email me at mindy at utahharmreduction.org. Because we always need more volunteers. And especially okay. as we expand to more places, we definitely totally. need volunteers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You guys are the best. Totally. Thank you. You're the best. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. Mm -hmm.